so thank you Kiran, for the kind introduction and uh, inviting me on this uh, webinar series and uh, thank you everyone for joining today uh, for listening my work on a, a relatively new mode of rapid stress response signaling in aerobidopsis thaliana oh sorry um, and, and which involves this regulation of uh, cytosolic translation let me minimize this which involves the regulation of cytosolic translation by this protein kinase called gcn2 and which we have found that it works under the command of uh, chloroplastic reactive oxygen species um, so you know alice already provided a very nice background on the importance of photosynthesis and you know again i don't need to go into much detail than just to say that you know um, like it, you all know photosynthesis is one of the most important biochemical processes on earth um, and, and increasing photosynthetic efficiency means uh, better plant health and better yield which translates into um, you know greater good for the humankind uh, in terms of food and uh, better health um, sadly photosynthesis is not as efficient as we think uh, with you know uh, it's limited by several physical and biochemical factors uh, that limit the net photosynthetic output of a typical leaf around five percent um, so one such uh, critical factor that limits the photos achieving higher photosynthetic output is the phenomenon um, uh, of excess light stress uh, which simply put is the light absorbed by a plant beyond its photosynthetic capacity so uh, excess light stress is a major agronomic issue that affects all photosynthetic plants and blue green algae. Um, and as uh, mentioned earlier, uh, it's, it's essentially the light absorbed by plants beyond their photosynthetic capacity. So uh, this picture is of a Japanese animal leaf uh, and it's showing you know, remarkable heterogeneity in terms of uh, photosynthetic output, I'm sorry. Um, and showing that you know in a, in a given leaf on at a given time uh, there are areas which blue color you know uh, denoting that low photosynthetic output versus red areas showing nice uh, photosynthetic output. So um, just because you know there are areas which are suffering from excess light absorption and excess light stress. Um, so when does excess light stress occur? Um, so excess light stress occurs during you know slow diurnal changes or even rapid fluctuations uh, of like cloud movement, uh, wind driven movement of canopies, and uh, excess light stress essentially you know uh, it affects the chloroplast function by generating uh, reactive oxygen species by a process called as uh, photo inhibition. So. You know, Arabidopsis uh, seedlings um, that, that have been grown on, on a 16 hour light and eight hour dark period, um, dark adopted for 24 hour. And, and if you look at uh, the ROS accumulation in these uh, dark adapted seedlings using a, a ROS sensitive dye, um, it, it hardly shows any signal. Whereas these dark adapted seedlings, if they are re-exposed back to the light um, within 30 minutes, you can see uh, the accumulation of this reactive oxygen species. Sorry, uh, yeah, uh, re reactive oxygen species more in a in a more localized fashion than all all in the entire leaf. Um, if you zoom in over here, you'll find that most of this uh, ROS accumulation is happening inside the chloroplast, as shown by this uh, yellow color. So, um, you know. This suggests that excess light stress, you know, triggers the accumulation of ROS in the chloroplast. So, how do plant cells, uh, you know, deal with this uh, excess light stress in terms of, you know, sensing, signaling, and what kind of response do they have towards it? Um, so, you know, a kinetic analysis of the complete uh, um, stress response time for plant um, uh, that have been exposed to high light after a low light acclimation reveals that uh, where transcriptional response takes more than an hour, I'm sorry, uh, ribosome loading, which is a translational response, takes, you know, uh, within 10 minutes, uh, very, very, you know, kind of, hap kind of happening right after the ROS accumulation, which is happening within one minute. So, uh, you know, cytosolic translation seems to provide a faster, a rapid response control uh, in, in case of the excess light stress. Now, we all know about you know, cytosolic translation. It's a highly regulated process. And of the three steps uh, in, in translation, that is the initiation, elongation, and termination, 
Uh, initiation uh, is the primary target for regulation and the stress conditions. And um, the two um, so-called sentinels, I, as, I, as I say, are the two major kinases in the plants that uh, are involved in this uh, sensing and, and regulation of translation initiation are the target of rapamycin or TOR kinase. I'm sure everybody is well aware of this. And the other kinase is the general control of uh, non reproducible 2 or the GCN2 kinase. Uh, which is interestingly found to handle most of this uh, stress response uh, in, 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 in plants. And uh, conventionally, GCN2 kinase is known to be activated by binding to uncharged tRNAs in case of amino acid starvation, which has been seen in case of uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae or in case of mammalian systems. Now, once the GCN2 kinase is activated, it phosphorylates its target, which is the um, uh, um, alpha subunit of uh, heterotrimeric uh, translation initiation factor called as EIF2 alpha subunit. And uh, that leads to downregulation of global translation. And uh, at the same time, preferential translation of certain transcripts um, that involve upstream or open reading frames. Now, this phosphorylation of EIF2 alpha under stress condition is, uh, is so well conserved across all the eukaryotes that it is termed as the integrated stress response. And it's found in flies, C. elegans, humans, uh, yeast model systems. And, uh, and where in, in case of mammals, there are four kinases that can uh, sense four different stress conditions and they phosphorylate the same EIF2 alpha. What makes plants in you know, Arabidopsis uh, special is that um, there is only uh, one GCN2 kinase that can phosphorylate EIF2 alpha at a very specific site. So this makes a very nice model system to dissect the role of, uh, you know, what's what's the biochemical significance of EIF2 alpha phosphorylation and also about the GCN2 kinase EIF2 alpha module itself. Um, so. Uh, um, you know, having this background, we started out with a question is that uh, does GCN2 kinase phosphorylate EIF2 alpha under excess light stress? So upon checking uh, the GCN2 activity uh, by a EIF2 alpha phosphor specific immunoblot with, uh, you know, seedlings that have been grown in long day periods, so 16 hour light, 8 hour dark, we see that uh, GCN2 activity follows a day night, uh, uh, a day night of activity. Um, so, you know, the activity goes up, as you can see, the EIF2 alpha phosphorylation goes up during the day and uh, goes back during the night, again, back during, you know, goes up during the day and back during the night, uh, that is shown over here uh, using this graph. Um, this day-night pattern very nicely, you know, mimics the hydrogen peroxide oscillations that has been published by other groups under the day-night period where um, the uh, hydrogen peroxide levels also go up during the day and they fall during the night. So in order to uh, get in a closer look at the GCN2 activation uh, you know, response in terms of excess light stress, we set up an assay with a long day condition aerobitopsis seedling. So 16 hour light, eight hour dark, and uh, at ZT2, that is means uh, the next day, two hours into the light, uh, these seedlings were dark adapted for 24 hour. And the idea is to attain basal ROS levels. Hopefully the dark treatment will do that. And um, a sample at T0, that's the end of 24 hour dark, um, uh, was collected. And uh, these seedlings were put back in the same light conditions as over here. Excuse me. So shown over here is uh, just a positive control for the EIF2 alpha phosphorylation. Um, and, and what you see over here is that in the wild type plants, uh, you see that within 30 minutes, GCN2 is activated when the seedlings are put back in the light. And this peaks around two hours. Uh, and this is a GCN2 dependent process uh, where you have a GCN2 null mutant, you don't see any phosphorylation at all. Um, under these uh, conditions, both in GCN2 and wild type, you can see that the EIF2 alpha levels uh, remain uh, uh, constant throughout without any change. Now, GCN2, this, this excess light triggered GCN2 activation is also, uh, it also follows a light dosage effect with, uh, you know, you can see that two micro Einstein, 25 micro Einstein, 80 micro Einstein, which was used over here and 200 micro Einstein. You can see that there is a nice uh, light dosage effect on, on the GCN2 activity with the peaks, you know, around 30 minutes of 200 micro Einstein just, uh, you know, peaks the EIF2 alpha phosphorylation levels. 
So um, now since, you know, chloroplast photosynthesis and there is excess light triggered effect on GCN2 activation, uh, we asked, you know, next question is that, can we, you know, can we uh, manipulate this pathway by applying photosynthetic inhibitors? Uh, you know, if you apply any photosynthetic inhibitors uh, uh, and, and change, hopefully, the chloroplast ROS levels, how, how will that affect the cytosolic uh, GCN2 um, EIF2 alpha module? So um, shown here is the classic Z scheme of uh, photosynthetic electron transport uh, with major sites of the ROS production. Um, so you know, PS2, PS1, and uh, at the plastoquinone level, uh, you know, hydrogen peroxide production. Um, we, um, we used in, in our assays a DCMU, which blocks the electron transfer between the QNON A and the QNON B. So that's reducing you know, the amount of uh, ROS that is being made. Um, and also we apply DBMIB, which blocks the electron transport between cytochrome B6F complex and the P700. And uh, again, this also blocks the ROS production. And on the other side, we used methyl valogen, uh, also known as paraquet. Um, it's an extremely potent herbicide that actually, um, you know, it exasperates, it generates a lot of, uh, triggers a lot of generation of uh, superoxide um, that essentially leads to the massive amount of hydrogen peroxide very rapidly uh, into the plant cell. So we have DCMU and DBMIB that will lower the ROS levels, and we have MB that's gonna, you know, upper upregulate the amount of ROS levels. So uh, uh, we had a very similar setup, you know, 16 hours light, uh, eight hour dark cone seedling, dark adapted for 24 hours. And then 30 minutes prior to light exposure, we spray these seedlings in dark with the DCMU or DBMIB. And what we see is that once we expose these seedlings back into the light, uh, DCMU and DBMIB are able to you know, suppress this light mediated, light triggered GCN2 activation, which is kind of neat that we find that photosynthetic inhibitors uh, may be you know, suppressing the amount of ROS and which is translating you know, into the uh, uh, GCN2 EIF to alpha module uh, regulation or management in the cytosol. Uh, on the other side, like I said, MV is a very potent, um, uh, strong herbicide that generates you know, massive amount of ROS. And uh, at ZT2, uh, if you apply a methyl valogen, you see that you know, within 10 minutes, uh, uh, it essentially activates the GCN2 kinase uh, uh, you know, massively in the cytosol with this EIF to alpha phosphorylation level speaking within 10 minutes. Um, so we also looked at uh, what, what happens to the ROS and uh, if we apply DCMU uh, before the excess light stress, 30 minutes, uh, it actually suppresses the production of ROS in the plants. And, uh, and uh, same thing with a methyl valogen. Again, like I said, you know, it's, it's massively upregulates the ROS levels, which can be seen over here, a lot of ROS in the plant cells. So it translates nicely that, uh, that the hydrogen peroxide that is generated in the chloroplast under excess light stress uh, is you know, somehow able to uh, go out and activate the GCN2 uh, uh, in the cytosol that leads to EF to alpha phosphorylation. So now we know that, you know, the, yes, the chloroplast is the major producer of uh, ROS during the light period, the photosynthetic period, but then again, there are other sources of ROS in the plants, right? I mean, mitochondria makes ROS, ER makes ROS, uh, the apoplast, you know, is involved in making reactive oxygen species. So in order to test that, what we did was we have a very similar setup, you know, Arabidopsis seedlings that were uh, uh, grown over 16-hour light, 8-hour dark period, dark adapted for 24-hour. And in the dark itself, we added, uh, what we did was we uh, 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 tried to play around with mitochondrial stress or the ER stress. So in order to induce a mitochondrial raw stress, uh, we subjected these seedlings with uh, 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 hypoxia stress, um, uh, low oxygen, and followed by reoxygenation. So when you reoxygenate uh, after hypoxia to aerobitopsis seedlings, it's known to uh, cause a production of superoxide in the mitochondria. And, and what we see is that in dark, that does not lead to any GCN2 activation. Same thing if you apply sham and antimycin A, these are mitochondrial uh, respiratory poisons um, and application of these has been shown to upregulate ROS in the mitochondria. You know, neither of them uh, could not, uh, they could 
you know, activate the cytosolic GC into kinase. Tunicamycin is a classic ER stress, uh, raw stress inducer. Even tunicamycin failed to activate the GC into kinase activation. So this suggests that somehow uh, there is some sort of specificity in terms of this GCN2, EIF2 alpha activation, the cytosol through the chloroplast ROS. It has, you know, the, the ROS has to come from the chloroplast. So with all this, you know, how does the GCN2 mutant, uh, the null mutant that I had shown earlier, um, that, you know, how does it respond in, in terms of physiology, in terms of high light stress? So in order to perform this, you know, we, um, we set up what is called as a highlight stress sensitivity assay. So we grew a wild type and uh, uh, the GCN2 mutant uh, seedlings for uh, three days. And uh, later on, one set was transferred uh, to control. So 80 microns time of light uh, and the other set, so 80 microns time of light and the other set was transfer transferred to tenfold more. So around you know, 800 micro Einstein uh, of, uh, of light for three days. And um, what we see is that, you know, after three days of uh, highlights treatment, uh, the GCN2 mutant seedlings, you can see the roots are shorter compared with the wild type as shown over here, um, a very significant difference. And, uh, you know, this is just a diagnostic test to show that there is something going on in the GCN2 mutant seedlings in terms of, uh, you know, response towards the highlight stress. Um, same thing, we also measured the fresh weight of the GCN2 mutant seedlings, and we find that it's, you know, uh, less is compared with the wild type uh, um, seedlings. Uh, we also measured the PS2 efficiency in terms of, uh, you know, tr trying to understand if there is uh, any effect on the chloroplast. And we also, you know, found that uh, upon recovery from the highlight stress, so after three days of highlight stress and giving a 24-hour recovery, we find that GCN2 mutant seedlings, they kind of uh, are drag, you know, they, they are below in terms of PS2 efficiency in terms of the wild type. So there is definitely something going on uh, uh, suggesting that loss of GCN2 increases the sensitivity towards highlight. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, since, GCN2 kinase and, and like I said, the EIF2 alpha eukaryotic initi translation initiation factor, which is involved in the translation process, we went uh, to the next stage and asked that, uh, does GCN2 uh, mutant, do they differ in global translation uh, uh, than wild type under excess light stress? So in order to uh, do that, we've performed uh, you know, polysome profiling um, generated by you know, sucrose density gradient centrifugation with the wild type and the GCN2 uh, mutant. So shown over here is a 24 hour dark acclimated wild type and GCN2 uh, and then uh, two hours into the light. So two hours of excess light stress. So what we see is that uh, in 24 hour dark, you know, the polysome levels are low. So translation is running at low. It's very similar in case of wild type and GCN2. Uh, very interestingly, after two hours of excess light stress, um, both wild type and GCN2 show up regulator up you know, higher polysome levels and lower monosomes, meaning that they are doing active translation, but at a very similar, you know, levels, um, which was very interesting. So now, <clears throat> excuse me. So, you know, um, uh, uh, given that, you know, there, there is regulation of GCN2 kinase and EIF2 alpha, a very specific on the chloroplast uh, ROS, we had thought that there might be a difference between the wild type and GCN2. And, uh, you know, given this result, it suggests that it may be attributed to, again, some sort of cell type regulation rather than a tire leaf. That's what we had shown earlier that uh, it seems that the ROS uh, generation in the leaf is not all over the leaf, but uh, only in uh, specific areas. And maybe those are the areas which may be um, you know, affected by uh, uh, specifics, you know, regulation of translation. So now, we know that you know uh, chloroplast is the site of herbicide action. So you know the classic glyphosate or the you know glyphosinate ammonium you know basta that we use in the labs you know uh, for transgenic screening and chlorosulfuron uh, example of sulfonylurea. They all act on uh, chloroplast uh, specific enzymes and that blocks amino acid pathway. So glyphosate is known to block aromatic amino acid you know, pathway, chlorosulfuron branch in amino acid, and uh, glyphosinate ammonium basta, uh, uh, it blocks the glutamine uh, uh, amino acid pathway. So, uh, you know, 
since they affect the chloroplast, we thought, okay, let's apply these herbicides and see uh, if if that upregulates, you know, uh, GCN2 kinase activity. And indeed, that application of chlorosulfuron, uh, you know, very rapidly activates the cytosolic GCN2 kinase. And uh, very similarly, if you uh, pre-treat plants with DCMU or DBMIB, the photosynthetic inhibitors, they are able to suppress this chlorosulfuron-induced activity. So. Um, now, once we got this, you know, we, we thought, okay, let's go back and ask the question again. How does chlorosulfuron affect the global translation in GCN2 kinase and wild type? So chlorosulfuron, interestingly, downregulates uh, global translation in the only in the wild type. So shown over here is the wild type Mansberg, mock and treated with chlorosulfuron. You see that the polysome levels go down in case of uh, uh, after chlorosulfuron treatment. While in case of GCN2 kinase, the PYM ratios of polysome versus monosome ratio uh, remains, you know, uh, um, you know, non-significant. So there's, uh, you know, very specific in case of wild type, chlorosulfuron is able to inhibit the global translation. So uh, what we did was we then, uh, you know, isolated the mRNAs from the polysome fraction and also the monosome fractions of the uh, uh, GCN2 kinase mutant profile and also the wild type. And then, um, you know, we did a microarray analysis. And uh, what we found that, you know, after the translatome analysis, that there is no major difference between the wild type and the GCN2 uh, under the control, so mock treatment. However, uh, there is a, you know, very nice difference between there are set of genes that are getting actively translated or repressed in case of GCN2 kinase versus the wild type. So this is, uh, um, these are the, uh, wild type herbicide treated samples, and this is the GCN2 kinase herbicide treated sample. And in conclusion, we found that a GCN2 kinase preferentially is affecting the translation of mRNAs that are involved in uh, defense related proteins like peptidases or chi uh, chitinases. Now, uh, I'm not going to show this here, but then uh, we have we had collaborated with uh, Dr. Brad Day's lab in Michigan State, and uh, we, you know, we showed that there is some. Uh, we did, you know, their lab did some experiment with Pseudomonas syringae, uh, uh, you know, the, the chitin, fungal chitin and Pseudomonas syringae infection. And we have found that uh, there is uh, GCN2 kinase is uh, uh, somehow not able to uh, sustain this kind of infection as compared to the wild type. So definitely something is going on in the GCN2 kinase in terms of uh, translational control versus the wild type in terms of both abiotic and now biotic stresses. Um, so in summary, what I've shown you all today is that excess light stress um, uh, you know, hampers the chloroplast function. And uh, due to that, chloroplast is under stress. And that leads to accumulation of uh, raw specifically in the chloroplast. And uh, this triggers uh, stress acclimation signal signaling. And uh, for the rapid stress response, translational control comes to save save the plant. And uh, this is able to, you know, uh, uh, constitute what is called as a rapid acclimation response. So now we have we have this this whole idea that yes, in excess light stress and in case of herbicide stress, uh, the plants are using this uh, very conserved module that is actually in all, you know in other eukaryotes also. That's the GCN2 EIF2 alpha module. But uh, is the chloroplast a ROS mediated GCN2 EIF2 alpha uh, a regulation? Is it conserved in other kind of abiotic stresses or in case of biotic stresses? So. The, the question is that is, is the ROS triggered GCN2 activation conserved to other stresses that may act via the chloroplast? So uh, we, you know, recently we showed that yes, uh, that is seems to be the case that we have shown uh, with the salt and also with the cold stress, um, it also uses the chloroplast ROS system to activate the cytosolic GCN2 kinase. Um, today I have shown you all the excess light stress, day night cycle, herbicide, um, they, they use the chloroplast ROS system. And we have new evidence suggesting that, uh, uh, you know, stress hormones like salicylic acid and jasmonic acid and methyl jasmonate, they're also using the same system to activate uh, the cytosolic GCN2 kinase. So it remains to be investigated if UV light, ultraviolet light that is known to activate the GCN2 kinase and recently a pseudomonas syringe. Uh, article that showed it also activates the GCN2 kinase. It all, does it also go through the chloroplast ROS system? Um, so, you know, our future work is more geared towards identifying uh, the specificity of uh, uh, this signal 
you know, that's coming out of the uh, chloroplast that is activating the cytosolic GCN2 kinase and, uh, you know, essentially shifting the equilibrium towards when the GCN2 kinase is able to phosphorylate IF2 alpha. And also, uh, uh, what sort of uh, mRNAs that are specifically, you know, under the control of GCN2 kinase in the cytosol? Um, um, so, so, you know, that will help us understand uh, are there any conserved or core set of stress response mRNAs that belong to all these, you know, abiotic and biotic stresses? And also, what are the specific stress of mRNAs that fall under each each category of uh, abiotic and biotic stresses? So, uh, with that, I would uh, like to thank, you know, my uh, postdoc advisor Albert Monanim, and uh, you know, current and former lab members uh, Ricardo you know, a senior graduate student, he did most of the bioinformatic analysis for the microarray and, you know, uh, um, help us, um, you know, analyze the data sets. Uh, Dr. Brad Day, Michigan State, uh, helped us with some of the pathogen related uh, work. Um, some of the former undergraduates, they were uh, actively involved in both the, uh, both the publications and um, the funding from NSF and NIH. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ansel. That's really excellent. Yeah. Excellent work. And as, yeah. as you say, yeah. a couple of nice publications recently on, on, on this work. So um, let me ask first of all, so you said you, you're going to be looking at the different stresses and whether the same mRNAs are regulated. So will you be doing these those polysome gradients for that sort of that sort of work? Is that in the plan? No, no the yeah, well that we have moved to an advanced stage. We are doing ribosome footprinting. Uh, because that would, that's going to reveal it better, uh, you know. I think, uh, yeah, the the level of resolution that we want, you know, and the information we can squeeze out of that, I think ribosome footprinting is the right way to do it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, question from uh, Sabine Zimmerman, and she asks, "What's the difference between in the translatome and the proteome?" Excellent. <laughs> Excellent question. So, a uh, translatome is something that is getting actively translated. So the mRNAs that are in the ribosome, you know, the polypeptide that is the nascent peptide that is coming out, we are looking at these uh, uh, mRNAs that are getting actively translated. So that would I would call as translatome. Proteome means all the protein that is uh, in the plant. So you know, things can be getting degraded or some you know in granules or any place. So it will constitute the entire proteome. Our focus has been uh, looking specifically at the translatome, but I guess, you know, um, at some point we would like to know, uh, looking at the entire, you know, the proteome and, and what fraction of that is uh, the translatome getting regulated with the GCN2 kinase. So, yeah, excellent question. Yeah. So a question from uh, Murray Grant, and Murray asks, uh, so he, he comments that, uh, uh, 200 micro Einstein is not really excess light. So do you see significant differences between suppression of FBU, FM during transition between 80 and 100, uh, 80 and 200 micro Einstein? 200, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, nice question. So um, there have been articles that have shown is that if you, uh, um, so let me take a step back. So you're right, 200 micro Einstein, you know, with Arabidopsis, it's a, a, you know, you can grow them and they'll be adapted and they'll be okay. But then if you dark adapt seedlings that have been grown on 80 microenstein, that's the reason we dark adapted with 24 hour. And when you expose them back to the light, uh, that's where the excess light stress triggers in. Um, so, and, and going back to the, um, uh, to answer the question about FEFM values, yes, we have uh, measured between 80, well, we have measured during the 80 microenstein in Landsberg and ZT, uh, uh, GCN2 mutants, there is not a lot of difference uh, uh, between the, when I say a lot of, that means they are, remain unchanged between the mutant and the wild type. Now, comparison of 80 and 200, uh, again, uh, it's not significant unless you hit the plants with 800 micro Einstein and then you start seeing there is some difference between them. Okay, uh, so a question from uh, Tapan, and they ask, do uncharged tRNA um, Refer, does that refer to all 15 tRNAs, or does it? Uh, is there any specificity there? Um, to answer your question, we don't know in plants. I mean, it has been a challenge to do, you know, tRNA estimation on which uncharged tRNA might be activating. Uh, but then, you know, uh, in mammalian systems, it has been uh, shown. I think 2019 there was a very nice PNS article uh, showing that uh, this is again in mammalian GCN2 kinase that. 
Um, you can actually purify the kinase and you can activate it by just the piece stock of the ribosome without the need of the uncharged DNA. So it seems that, uh, I'm again diverting from your question, uh, but then it seems that GCN2 kinase seems to have other modes of uh, uh, activation. Now, which uncharged DNA? I mean, you can take, you know, I think Sesma at all, uh, there was an article regarding the Saccharomyces GCN2 kinase, and you can activate the GCN2 kinase by uh, any of the uncharged DNAs, yeah. Okay, so a question from uh, Zahir, and he asks, why only why is only chloroplast ROS specific for GCN2? Uh, excellent, that's the million dollar question here. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's 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 a tough one because that's exactly what we are looking into. Is that why why chloroplast ROS? And and to add to that, you know, uh, is it only chloroplast ROS? So so is it chloroplast ROS directly the G, to the GCN2 kinase, like at the protein level, or it's something else that is actually doing something to it, and then it translates to the GCN2 kinase? So yeah, that's an excellent question. Yeah, we don't know. That's yeah. It's almost like you knew what the question was going to come before before it came there. You're smiling. <laughs> yeah. I guess you get that all the time. So a question from uh, Branda Graf, and Branda asks, uh, uh, it just points out that all this work is obviously in Arabidopsis. So what do you expect uh, in plant species that can grow in naturally different environments, like differences between high intensity sensitivity and less intensity yeah. sensitive plant species? Yeah. Really, really good question. So, how does it translate into you know maize, which is you know or in that case tomato or tobacco, which are high light you know plants and they love that. Yeah. So uh, that's something that is ongoing. Uh, you know, we are looking into you know uh, we are setting up collaborations to look into how does this all work translate into you know say maize, you know, uh, which will be extremely useful. The uh, the interesting part over here is that all plants, you know, starting from uh, like Arabidopsis as a model system, be the Medicago in, you know, soybean, maize with, you know, grapes, all of them have GCN2 kinase and EIF2 alpha. So that system, that module is very well conserved. So your question is, yes, very well valid. How does it translate into that? Now, um, you know, Nigel Halford's lab, you know, they have done a remarkable work in terms of looking at barley and other plant systems. So uh, they have shown that, yes, you know, there is a GCN2 kinase mediated EIF to alpha phosphorylation in case of, uh, you know, different stress conditions. Now, not, you know, again, not specifically how chloroplast ROS is involved. But uh, given that, you know, there is this conservation, I would assume that, yes, we can take these aspects and start applying there also. Yeah. But great question. Yeah. <laughs> 